right. Let's see if anybody else shows up. 5.30 is always a tricky time. I test this at different times over yeah. the next couple of months. Let's see what it does. Okay. Seems like, all right, so we got most people are focused on how can I hold on to myself in a relationship? So let's run with that. So this all starts with owning your feelings. It comes back to self-reference. It's like, oh, what, what do I feel about this? What do I think about it? Um, and that's the real trick in, in the relationship model for, for codependency is because we're, we've got a very strong habit of giving ourselves up in the form of, okay, they want this, so I'm going to do that. We don't stop to see if that's what we want. We don't check in with our, um, our body. You know, is it saying yes to this? Is it saying no to this? And am I slowing down enough to gauge whether or not my desire to do something that they want is actually my desire or if it's one of my impulses, one of the codependent impulses like pleasing or fixing or caretaking. And that's why we have to become really keen about what those uh, impulses feel like in our body. So then when that shows up, we can stop and go, okay, this is my pleaser impulse and I want to stop. What do I, and then we can start listening. What do I really want? And that's probably a no. When, when, when pleasing shows up, I, I have found more more times than not, it's because we actually want to say no to what's going on, but we're scared of of their disappointment, of their rejection, or or some sort of um, calamity, like, like punishment because of it. And so we have to get really honest with ourselves. We have to become really willing to um, work out our relationship with disappointment and conflict and difference. Um, cause you know, if we're, if we're really in a, a narcissistic relationship and we say no, and that person punishes us for saying no, then it's time to get the hell out of the relationship. It's, it's not time for us to fix ourselves, or change something cause that's bullshit. Um, that's not for us, but if we're in a relationship that's healthy, then they're going to go, okay, you don't want to do that. I can respect that. Or they'll invite a discussion about it so they can understand your position but they're not going to gaslight you. They're not going to attack you. Um, they're not going to shame you and they're not going to attack your character. Um, so that first step is referencing. You've got to create a habit of referencing yourself. Is this what I really want? Or is one of my codependent impulses in action here? And sometimes that takes time. So it's okay to say, I don't know if I want to do that right now. I'll get back to you. Um, the more you practice it though, especially if you're doing it in, in calm situations, like you're at the store shopping for food or something, um, it's a lot easier because there's, there's no you know, risk in happening. It's more like, oh, I don't want that tomato. I want this peak or whatever. We, we become more and more tuned in to our want impulse, to our yes and no uh, sensations so that we can manage that. Um, beyond that is a constant loyalty and respect for what we want and for what we don't. When we start saying yes to things we don't want, we are going to lose ourselves in the relationship. Um, so fundamentally, we're really talking about boundaries, the most basic boundary of yes and no, and, and your own personal authority and personal autonomy. That's what you want. Um, another way to hold on to yourself in the relationship is, is to become aware of how you might be mimicking or taking on attributes of the person in order to um, feel closer to them. That this happens um, when we we want someone to to like us, or we we want them to like us more, or pay attention to us. We'll emulate them. Um, there are studies out that show that couples that are in love tend to emulate and pick up on each other's nuances. I'm not talking about that. I'm, I'm talking about um, this, this mimicking that comes in with like, I'll be like that person so that they'll like me. 
oh, I'll be this because then they'll like me. The reference is always about the other person liking you. And that's a, that's a pleasing reference. It's like, if I do this, maybe they'll like me. Or if I do this, they'll like me. And, and it's, it's very subtle in our thinking. And that's why we have to be really, really attuned to those impulses, the codependent impulses. So we know when we're trying to find ourselves through someone else. Um, staying in your body, it's an our key. That's mindfulness. That's presence. It's like, oh, here I am. Um, that allows you to root into your separation from the other individual. Um, it's allowing yourself to have differing opinions um, on topics and to give yourself a chance to hear them and allow yourself to be expressed as well. So holding on to yourself in a relationship is about practicing your individuality, occupying your space, staying in your body, and being willing to deal with conflict, disappointment, and saying yes and no. It's a basic fundamental boundaries. Okay. So that was when you, you had uh, checked off there, Connie. What do you think about that? Sounds, sounds good to me. It is, it's interesting to, because I, I always noticed when I was, especially like in high school and college, that I would, like in a group of people, I would start mimicking other people. Mm -hmm. And I've always, I've always wondered what that was about. Um, so, yeah, it, it's been good practice, that kind of keeping, keeping aware of that. Yeah, it's a big one. Um, it's not something you're, you're likely to, to ever completely eliminate, I began, um, from your world because of how ingrained it is into our habits. So it's, it's kind of neurologically it's here, we, we get to live with it. Um, but the more you practice it, the more you'll see it and the more you'll just, oh yeah, I'm going to try to mimic, I'm going to do this instead. Because you'll know what you want to do versus what you feel like you should do. And that's a real real important indicator there is shooting is always yeah. about pleasing. Um, it is never ever about your own satisfaction. It can be about your safety. And if you're in a situation where you're with some, someone who turns out to be an asshole, you know, you know how to get out of it. Trick is, is you don't stay. You, you, you eliminate it as fast as possible. But yeah. Watch out for the mimicking. I mimic. Um, and I have to watch it real carefully sometimes. Um, but there, there is a signal that, that shows up with attraction. And this is, this is where things can be confusing. And I want to touch on this a bit for, for everyone that's, gonna, that's watching and, and will be watching. Um, attraction, uh, we, we know that, that when we're really into somebody and they're into us, we'll, tip, we'll pick up their habits, we'll pick up their idioms, phrases they say, the way they say them. Little, little antics they do. Um, I, I mean, I, I remember when I was, I was dating a gal I was really into, she has a, an accent because she's from Texas. And I caught on to her, I started picking up her accent. I've got to pick this up. And it really uh, <laughs> it startled me. I'm like, oh, I'm doing that. That's, that. that's mirroring. It's a normal function of pairing because um, we, we tend to emulate people we're attracted to, but that, that is not coming from an angle of pleasing. That is actually autonomic. You won't catch it until you're doing it. It's because you just really like the person. So there's a big difference there. The mimicking is like, I have to be this way so I fit in. Emulation is like, I just kind of adore them. You're, you're not really concerned about being rejected. You just like this. Let's see, let's see who else. Okay, so Kellen did. Okay, cool. How are you, Brianne? Oh, good. Can you hear me? Yep, I can hear you. Okay, so I guess you heard all my kids' stuff. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Kids. Is. Hi. Hi, kids. Yeah, you can talk to them, but you need to be quiet because I'm... Nova and Hunter. Hello. Hello. How are you? <laughs> All right. So now, um, let's see. I think Anna, that was, it was, yeah, Andrea. She clicked out the second question. How do I, what do I do instead of uh, ruminating? Mm, 
Yes, rumination. So let's define rumination so everybody knows what it is. Rumination is dwelling in the past. It's like savoring the past moment. Usually it's on something negative. Like, oh yeah, that person that, that rejected me back in third grade. And it feels like this. And we kind of just build on it. And it's part of, we, we ruminate in order to avoid the deeper feeling. It's a way of stringing ourselves along emotionally. So it's like, oh, um, I, I'll just wallow in it rather than resolve it and deal with the discomfort that comes with resolving uh, that pain. So what do we do instead of ruminating? We accept. We embrace the pain and we move through it using the regulation process. And then if you really want to get closure, you can use the closure technique. Um, but we begin to access and understand the pain without enabling the story because rumination depends on story and story is the explanation of why something happened you know so and so her name was melissa rejected me through grave because i'm ugly that was my story so i'd ruminate on that and use it as means to justify other points of view and conclusions and so when i knocked that out all that went away but i had to get out of the story and get to the real pain because it was really a humiliating experience and then I was like, oh, now I'm fine. Move on with my life. So that's what we do with rumination. Rumination is a good signal. Something needs closure, but we've got to become responsible for it rather than playing the victim. Hey, Marshall. Willing in it. What? We have, we have peeps. Ew. <laughs> are you microwaving them? Are you trying to kill them? The peeps are just, I don't know. Do you like peeps? Yeah. Yeah? What do you what do you like about the peeps? They're, they taste good, and, th and they're made of marshmallows. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Candy, candy-coated marshmallows. And they, have you ever microwaved one? Thanks for the idea, Marshall. Yeah, yeah, yeah you should. And, I, and I'm going to eat some while, while I'm on my Kindle right now. Oh, good. Oh, good. It's a good thing she can't reach the microwave. Yeah. Oh, Brianne. He can reach the microwave. <laughs> no. What you do is you take little little toothpicks and you stick them in each other and you put two in there and you see what which one gets the other one first. <laughs> All right, so now we have, uh, it is Easter time, isn't it, Pete? Mom, climbing, climbing is when I. Okay, you finish. Uh, climbing is when my specialties and when my talents. Well, this is good. That means you can escape. I like climbing. I climbed a lot of trees. I grew up in a town called Flagstaff. It's basically really tall trees, and I climb to the top of the trees, <laughs> and then I throw pine cones at people. Um, or I would climb up to the tree and see. We lived in this house that was really tall. It was an A-frame, and there was all these windows, and my parents put the TV right in front of the window so I could sit in the tree and watch what they watched. So I sneak out my 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 bedroom window and climb up the tree and watch their movies. They never knew. So, yeah. All right. Guess, guess what? Okay. Can you uh, I'm going to go with one more question here, Hunter, and then we'll, we'll get to you. Okay. Got one more question to do. So what can I do instead of pleasing others? Nobody ticked this off, which is fine because I put out there because I like reiterating this idea of having an alternative to what we're doing. Same. So a lot of times, okay, I'm a pleaser. I'll stop pleasing. And then your brain's like, what do I do? Well, the only thing it knows what to do is go back to pleasing. So, so we get ourselves stuck in this loop. So what we do here is we find an alternative that gets us what we need. Because fundamentally, all the codependent behaviors are about getting needs met. Pleasing is about being accepted. It's about... Caring for someone is about contributing love. Fixing is about being valued. Say, so controlling is about feeling safe. Avoiding is about feeling safe. Um, rescuing is about wrestling with someone else's negative choices. It's about autonomy. It's like, oh, I need to let them do their thing. And that gives us permission to do our thing. So various needs can come into these 
these impulses. So what can I do instead of pleasing others? You can ask yourself a question. What do I need instead of pleasing them? Or what need will, or what, what, uh, yeah, what need or want will be fulfilled by pleasing them? That way you can start hearing yourself. You can hear the need behind the impulse and start going, oh, I need, I need to feel important. I need to feel valued. Okay. And then let's say we find that. I need to feel valued. I need to feel loved or, or acknowledged. Yet yeah, don't go to the person and ask them to validate and acknowledge you. That's not what you do. A lot of people will do that, but there's a problem in that because uh, we're still dependent on that person for the validation. See, and the whole goal here with codependency is to unattach that that need from that person and start returning it to us to become our own uh, authority. And so we first step in and go, okay, if I need validation, if I could, would I acknowledge and appreciate myself as I am? And if I could do that, when would I do that? Right now, using those those affirmation questions, we start tapping into our own need. We start becoming a little more self-reliant. We start opening up to, hey, my, my opinion about me matters too. And when we can start tapping into that and start uh, the process of fulfilling our own needs, then we're going to stop the habits of pleasing because it's going to be a lot easier because there's nothing to fill anymore. The, the bucket's full. So that's a that's a deep dive there. And that's why I put the question there because it's important to understand it's just not a new habit of like, well, if I want to please them, maybe I want to ask them something or what is my need. It's It's making that next step to taking ownership back of the need and then becoming um, practicing to fulfill it basically. I know it's not a little combobulated there, but it's taking ownership and then practicing the act of fulfilling it. If I need acknowledgement, which is, which is a valid child level need, I need to start validating me. I need my validation. I need to trust it and value it like I would this other person's value. And we do that and we allow that to settle in. Sometimes we do need somebody else's feedback. It's like, am I screwing up? How am I doing? What's your point of view? But that ought to be more rare than our self-validation. So it's, it takes both, but we need to rely on ourselves a little more in that category rather than on, on others. Okay. So, okay. So do you two have any other questions you want to ask or shoot at? Oh, I don't right now. I'm glad you answered that last question, though, because I actually didn't uh, do the poll, and that's the one I would have picked. Oh, there we go. Yeah. So. Yeah, pleasing others stops by checking in with ourselves, finding out our need, and then getting that need met. Uh, starting with ourselves first. Because child-level needs, and I'll, I'll, I'll post a PDF on child-level needs. Let me write that down. Um, are different from adult-level needs. Uh, child-level needs are like... Um, acknowledgement, validation, being seen, um, being nurtured, things like that. They're, they're things that build us up as a person. Adult level needs are being respected, being connected to various forms of intimacy. Um, both child level and adult level needs have um, four components. That's companionship, support, intimacy, and play. Um, but they are different. And we want to fill our childhood needs as much as possible. The more reliant we become on that with ourselves, the more healthy we are in our relationships because then we can say no. And that's the big trick here. Saying no is your happiness is on the other side of no. I say that a, a, a lot. And that is a very important quality because <laughs> we're addicted to relationships. It's codependence. Well, now we got to make relationships something that has a lot of condition on it so that we're constantly choosing ourselves first so okay cool. so childhood level needs should mm -hmm. be met by yourself so parenting yourself basically right majority and, of the time majority of the time yep yeah and then occasionally you can ask for validation well i guess 
this word can't it, It's about the weight. Like mm -hmm. a healthy adult's going to attempt to meet their needs first. Mm -hmm. And then if they're, and we all, we all have these amounts, right? I just, I don't know. It's not, it's not there. Then we ask, mm -hmm. but it's not like we try it once. Oh, it didn't work. I'm going to go ask. No, it's, I've been playing with this for a couple of days now kind of thing. Um, or, and, and generally, you know, healthy adults, they're going to ask for support and validation when something big has happened. They, there's a disruption, a, a relationship failed, they lost their job, a health diagnosis, somebody dies, there's an accident. Typically, it's a situationally triggered experience. Mm -hmm. Codependence, it's a chronic problem. So they're constantly seeking validation. Then mm -hmm. we, that, we've got to stop that chronic uh, habit and then you know if, if we need it because something's happened let's you know definitely reach out for support oh. so it, but it's um a lot of people struggle with this one i i've been there is it i'm looking for the pdf um but people have chewed me out with it before I'm like well you're obviously not happy that's why you're paying me to coach you and try this what but, about adult level needs? Are that some is that something that you meet by yourself as well, or is that typically adult level needs are actually based in the relationship category? Mm -hmm. Where did I put the PDF? Because it'll I haven't looked at it in months and months, but let's see. Um, because they 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 deal with um, the interchange between individuals, like adults. We we need different kinds of intimacy than like children do. Children generally need uh, attention, affection, protection, and play. And then, you know, boundaries and some basic discipline. Well, adults generally don't need those elements. They do need play, but there's different kinds of, you know, affection and intimacy. Uh, but they also need freedom. They need their independence. Um, they need a, a sense of respect, a positive warm regard between uh, the, the individuals in the relationship. So, mm -hmm. you know, if we're not getting that in a relationship, we need to step out and, and, and advocate for ourselves. We, we've got to step up for that. Where did they put it? There it is. Yeah, right here. Man, this document's old. Did this way back in 2013. <laughs> um, yeah, like child level needs, acceptance and validation, attention, being valued, respect, cared for, nurtured, availability, like the parent is available to them. Uh, they like spending time occupying space with them. They're safe, security, protection, playfulness. When those are adequately filled, we typically begin to experience a different set of needs that show up. Um, and they, the adult level needs are all about intimacy, safe vulnerability. Because when we're adults, we're not with mom and pa anymore. We're not their siblings. And if we have a healthy family dynamic, that's a safe zone. Well, now we, we reach out into the world. We adventure into the world. And now we're dealing with the uncertainty of other people. And so adults, we require to have intimacy. We need safe vulnerability. There is toxic vulnerability. That's... The toxic vulnerability is giving up information and making yourself emotionally available to someone who's going to harm you, like you know, a narcissist or an abusive individual. Um, so safe vulnerability is the ability to detect safe people and then share with them uh, what is appropriate for the context of that interaction. Um, let's see, yeah. So we got that safe... You know, the other needs that adults typically have is are, are the needs for freedom, the needs for expression, and then the needs for closeness and bond. And these two get in an argument a lot. They need to be close or connected and need to, to have space and be autonomous. Can have a lot of friction on them. It's where a lot of uh, power dynamics, power conflicts, control dynamics, control dramas uh, step into relationships there. It's because one or both partners are not willing to let the other person be autonomous and as close as they want to be. Mm 
they want them either closer or they want more space from them. Mm -hmm. And um, we have to we have to navigate that. So yeah. I hope that answers. How's that work for you, Brianne? Yeah, it was good. Since you're here, I can ask you. <laughs> yeah. That works. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, yeah, when when children or our inner child self has those child level needs um met adequately the adult version of ourselves tends to promote more confident self-approval we're more secure in who we are in our own sense of value um, we tend to be more present codependents we're not present we're in the past ruminating we're in the future fidgeting we're, we're out fretting about the, the doom um, now so engenders a lot more respect self-awareness and awareness of other people that's one thing codependency really robs us of is the ability to actually understand the other person because we, we, we're really good at analyzing the person to figure out what they want so we can give them what they want. But that's not what's, that's not really knowing the person, knowing the person stepping in back and going, Oh, I know they want this, but do they want it from me? Have even asked if they wanted it. Um, mm -hmm. The codependent doesn't automatically register the autonomy of the other person because they're absorbed in the practice of trying to please them. And pleasing can easily and typically breaches another person's boundaries pretty quick. I had <laughs> one individual, I was at a pool and um, she was insistent on drying my feet with her towel and and I told her straight up I'm like don't touch me I'll do it myself I'm a grown-ass man I can do this and she she literally pushed into me and did dried my feet mm -hmm. that is pleasing in action because it's a total ignoring of the other person's desire <laughs> if you really want to quote unquote be good at pleasing somebody you gotta listen and respect the boundary because you don't know what they want and that's another thing codependency does is we get so good at predicting what our parent wanted or what the the narcissist wanted that we assume this predictive value extends to all relationships and it it, it doesn't um, while we may be right many times, that that does not mean that we're right all the time. And it also means we're still assuming. When we make the assumption we know what somebody's thinking or feeling, we've robbed them and we've robbed ourselves of an opportunity to understand them and connect with them. And so pleasing, when we stop that, we start asking questions. It's like, what mm -hmm. do you want? I have this assumption you would like this. What do you think? And I'm like, nope, nope, I don't want pineapple on my pizza. Oh, okay, cool. Um, we also begin to hear them in a way that uh, it's kind of hard to explain because when, when I started hearing people for the first time, really, really tuning into to them uh, from the pleaser aspect into a connective aspect, like I hear this person, what they're saying, my brain's like, oh, I was thinking they wanted this, but here they're saying this. And it, the thinking in my head slowed way down because I'm, I wasn't analyzing anymore. I was like, oh, they, they want that. Oh, okay. No wonder they weren't responsive to me doing this. They're really looking for that over there. Oh, okay. Now I understand that better. Um, and I could hear by what they expressed innate boundaries, things that, that were natural to them that I didn't fit or that I did fit. And if there was something that I heard them say that I felt like, ooh, I could, I'd could, i like to give them that, then I would ask. And so it became very, very present, very much about connection. And um that there's definitely a tension. You have to deal with rejection there. That's just an uncomfortable experience at first, but then yeah, you get a little deeper into it. It's like, oh, they didn't want that, which means they have enough respect to say no. That's a big deal. 
because um, people are willing to tell us no. They they feel safe with us. They like us. They at, at a minimum they respect themselves, which means they by automatic extension do respect us because they could say, "Oh, I don't want that, but I'm going to take it from you anyway," and they're using you. Um, and I've had that. I imagine most of us have had that experience. Um, but people who do respect themselves will respect us by saying no. Yeah, that's that's really helpful. Yeah, okay, cool. Okay, anything else? I've got one. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a specific and special kind of guilt that comes up when really bad things happen in the news or in politics where I feel tremendously guilty that I am not doing more. Even though I know that on a, a grand scale, I am powerless. You know, I only have so much power, but I feel guilty for not doing what I have the power to do. Right. So I'm just wondering, because it doesn't respond to the same kind of guilt management, air quotes, that the, like a normal everyday guilt kind of does. All right. So guilt fundamentally is about breaking a rule. So the first thing you want to do is check in and see if that's a rule you agree with. ID, first you identify the rule. What rule is it that I broke? Am I supposed to be involved more? Should I be involved more? Um, and then yeah, you get to check in with your want. Not your should, but you can check in with the aspect of, do I want to be involved more? Is this actually important to me? Or am I feeling a pressure to, to make this important to me? I, I think, you know, with, with the, the shooting yesterday in the high school, a lot of people are dealing with this pressure. I should do more. I should get involved in politics, or I should do something in the community, or I should post something on Facebook, and stuff like that. So that... That's all the same fundamental issue is nobody's choosing what they want to do. Nobody's listening to what they want to contribute, or how they want to address this. They're going from a rule set. It says I should, or I have to, or I must. So when any guilt, whether it's really large or small, rational or not, is about that rule. So you first assess the rule. Do I agree with the rule? If I do, then what do I need to change? What do I want to change? Most of the time, you're going to find you don't agree with the rule. And then you let it go. You give yourself permission to, to respond to the situation on your terms. Um, and to explore your options there, because you don't have to respond a certain way. You have the right to choose how you respond to it, because that's part of occupying your own personal authority. Um, your conclusions about being powerless over something large like the school shooting or some sort of pol political dynamic, um, you know, you are not responsible for fixing that. You're not responsible for managing it. Um, and we know that when we look at the principles of ownership, who did the action who made the choice who had the desire and who had the feeling if it's not you in those answers then it's not really yours and when we look at social dynamics we all have been conditioned to believe we all have a portion of this thing that's going on i do not have a portion of what happened in florida and i have a portion of what happens in the white house because these people are making these choices the only thing I have a portion of in society is how I treat the people I have in my life. So that's my children, that's my friends, that's my clients, that's my family, the community I'm in. Now, if I feel inspired to contribute, I'm going to contribute where I have power, and that's in those areas. Um, so, And if I feel inspired to contribute at a national level, then I'm, I'm going to need to expand that region in in some way notice i'm saying inspired and not should um but yeah it all comes back to do you is this your rule or is this a rule someone else gave you and do you agree with it and if you don't what would you like it to be 
What do you think about that? It's going to take some thinking because I, I, you know, I do, when I feel guilt, I do look for the rule and I couldn't, um, couldn't really find it. Yeah. And that's why it was difficult for me. Yeah. It's going to be a subtle rule. We've all been conditioned to feel guilty. And there's this other aspect that comes in with tragedy. It's called survival guilt. Mm -hmm. And, um, like it should have been me or why did this happen to them and not me or you know why are my kids alive and there's not um if this is a misapplication of empathy um we have the right to be healthy wealthy secure we have the right not to have something bad happen to us um in other words we have the right to occupy the life we have despite what's happening next door or down the street or across the country or on the other side of the world. You have a right to still be happy. Um, I learned that in the others on the other side of that island, when my mother passed away, it was a, um, it was a, a brisk April morning. I went out for a bike ride and it was a Sunday morning. And um, <laughs> one of my friends, his name was Ben comes up to me. He's like, how are you doing? I'm like, well, mom died today. She's he's like, oh, well, that really sucks. And they went off and he played. And other people went off and played. Uh, people went to church. People went and bought groceries at the store. People had barbecues. The world moved on. That's not because it's in disrespect to the tragedy I was going through. It's in, it comes to the inclusion that we all have a different experience and that all is okay. It all matters. Um, so like, I mean, I've got kids in high school. And so when that happened yesterday and it's happened several times this year, you know, 18 times, I'm like, well, what do I want to do here? Why? I, Cause I would naturally feel this twinge of guilt. I'm like, I don't want to feel guilt. My son's alive. Theirs is not. And I will empathize and I will support them if, if, they wanted that from me um, but I'm not going to minimize my experience with them so survival guilt's a natural response it's an empathetic response but it's not necessarily something you got to stay in if that makes any sense it is okay to be happy when other people are sad so that that brings me to like an ongoing kind of chronic sense of survivor's guilt because I'm, I'm in a position, you know, financially, socially, where I'm not being impacted by the crap. Like, my everyday life has not changed. And I, but I see the pain that, you know, this, the political situation is causing other people yeah. every day. Yeah. And so, so how, if you have, it's not a one-time event that I need sure. to to move through survivor's guilt over. It's like all the time. Well, you have privilege. So what? Your privilege doesn't obligate you to fix somebody else's situations. You're not obligated to change something for them. You have the right to be where you're at and not feel guilty about it. And I imagine if you, had to, if you explore that, you open up to it and let go of the guilt for a little while, or at least set it aside and go, okay, what's the world like without the guilt? What do these situations look like without the guilt? What kind of responses do I come up when the guilt's out of the way? You'll actually find what you really want to do about them. And that's where you can make a real positive change. So. Yeah, that makes sense. All right, cool. Anything else? Anything else anybody wants to shoot at? I don't have anything. No? Yeah. Does Hunter have anything else? I actually went upstairs and he's really engrossed in the show, so. Yeah, got his questions answered. Yeah. <laughs> I went upstairs because I could, I was afraid you guys could hear the show. So I think he's okay. 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 Well, we'll do this again. Um, we may try even the Facebook approach, I guess.
because I know it can do two people. So we'll just see how that works maybe and play with it. Um, we'll also try some different times over the next couple of, of uh, you know, weeks to see where which one gets the most traction. 5.30 is the easiest one for me. So now I'll schedule something for like seven and we'll eight and we'll play with it and see what happens. Okay, thank you guys for showing up. If, um, if you have any, well, if you have any other questions that come up afterwards, just post them in the group. Otherwise, we'll talk next week. All right, see you, Marshall. Okay, thank Bye. you guys. Have a good night.